Amen. This week, a lot of stuff happened and something didn't happen. And you all remember last week I was talking to you all about the decision I needed to make regarding my schedule and time, how I spent it, particularly as it relates to my, what it become my full-time, part-time job, radio station. So, I spent this week, last week, doing things that were part of my other full-time job. You know, being a strategic mission developer in Jerry Indiana. The reason why I came here, I found that I had a lot of time. I had enough time to get sermon information to Tracy. I had time to call on people. I had time to prepare for Bible study. And I had time to get some rest. All of which was a very good thing. Of course, in order to do that, I had to decide that I didn't have time to be a radio personality anymore. I hope y'all will forgive me that one. But since I didn't come here to be a radio personality, I'm, I'm okay with that not being what I mean. You know. But if the Lord, you know, Besides something else, we'll figure it out together. But I do know this. I enjoyed having time to do my regular stuff. Amen. And one of the things that I had time to do was look at God's plan. God's painfully perfect plan. And so I want to share that with you today. But first, a tourist in Syria observed with interest how a shepherd drove all his sheep into a sheepfold one evening. The fold was an enclosing wall with only one opening. And on that opening, the tourist noticed that there was neither a door nor a gate. He remarked to the shepherd, well, can't wild beasts get in there? No, answered the shepherd, because I am the door. Yeah. Yeah. He continued, when the sheep are in for the night, I lie down across the doorway. No sheep can get out except over my body. And no wolf or thief can get in except through me. I think you see where I'm going with this, don't you? Now, think about this, though. The shepherd has a painful job. The ground is not soft. The wolves are not friendly. And the sheep are not always submissive. But his plan to protect and preserve them is perfect, for it takes all of these things into account. And the shepherd accomplishes his purpose. Now, that's not the sermon, though. But that was pretty good, huh? <laughs> Bow your hands, Lizzie. Bless the Lord. You have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart. That by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, Jesus is going to fulfill his mission, his vocation of redeeming us through his own blood. He makes use of the time by teaching the disciples about the salvation that he is about to accomplish. Based on that teaching, someone asked him a question. Beginning in verse 22. When Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem, Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. 
Now, two things are clear, at least to me at this point. First, it is understood that salvation is a good thing. People will seek it. But that's not the problem. Rather, if the ways they will seek it do not involve them being connected to Christ. They may involve good works. They may involve social engagement. But they do not involve going through the gate. I continue Jesus' words. When once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading. Sir, open the door for us. He will answer, I don't know you. Where are you are from? Then you will say, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you. Where do you come from? Away from me, all you evildoers. Now, first of all, those of you that have an ear to hear, you might recognize in those words a seeming reference to Holy Communion. You might recognize a reference to catechism in thought in our streets. And seemingly, at least on the surface, we are those type of people that do believe that baptism and the Lord's Supper really do something, that they really do give to you, first of all, in baptism, you're united to Christ in his death, your sins are washed away, and then the Lord's Supper gives to you the forgiveness of sins because it is for the forgiveness of sins. We believe that. That's why communion means something to us. That's why we're diligent to take it in for the Lord's Supper. It's not just something you do because Jesus said do it. You do it because Jesus promised to do something as you do it. And then teaching. We, we do believe that teaching is important, that the pure gospel actually saves. And when you take away from the pure gospel, you hurt people's salvation. You, you cause them to not trust in the Lord, but they begin to trust in other things. And when you teach a teaching that makes people put all their focus on their own good work, it takes their eyes off of Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. And so these things matter to us. But sadly, it is possible to do all the things that everybody does because you're part of the crowd, but you don't really believe it. And it's possible to think that just because you did those things, that God will ignore the fact that you don't really believe it. But he doesn't. He doesn't. You know, even showing up at church events, being a part of church activities, and socially active, and acknowledging the goodness of people and teaching, it's not enough. And it's not an issue of you need to do more than that. The issue is you need to do something other than that. As the old gospel song says, you must come in at the door. God's sending of his unique son, the missio day, is the divine decision that makes everything else make sense. It's the reason why God chose Abraham, why he promised to give him a son, why he chose Israel to be witness to the nations, and why that his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us who are under its curse. Isaiah 66, beginning at verse 18, says to us, For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues. And they shall come and see my glory, and I'll set a sign among them. And from them I will send survivors to the nations, Tarshish. Old and love, who draw the bow, the Tubal and Java, 
to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations. You see, Israel didn't understand. As a nation, especially among the religious leaders, they thought God had chosen Israel because of its comparative goodness. Or that God's choosing was for Israel's benefit. Because God liked Israel and wanted to bless them. He didn't like everybody else. But God's actions are not about our satisfaction. They are about his glory. Isaiah 66, beginning of verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Now, what is true worship? Jesus told that Samaritan woman that an hour is coming when you shall worship in spirit and in truth. But that's how true worships do it. But what does that, what is that? Well, true worship is the response we give to God for his blessing. It's not the key that opens the door to him, contrary to what some people have taught. For them, they say, that, well, if you want God to bless you, you've got to get God's attention. If you don't get God's attention, then he won't bless you. The problem with that is it presumes that somehow God doesn't know about you. And somehow God is oblivious to you. And so you've got to, you know, get his attention. Let him know that you're there. The reality is the exact opposite. God knew you while you were in your mother's womb. God knew the thoughts that he thought concerning you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. God is a plan that he had for you, plan to give you a future and a hope. God knew the salvation that he had for you before the foundation of the earth to send his son, the sending of God to redeem God's creation. And you remember now, we're the only part of God's creation that didn't just see the creation, he formed us. In his image and likeness. He did that because we were special to him. Now, part of that forming process is still going on. And it feels painful. Hebrews 12 addresses the notion that being conformed to the image of Christ is a picnic in case you didn't know. We're told in Hebrews 12 and 3, consider him who endured such from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint on But Jesus said in Matthew 10, beginning at verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. And if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they evil of his household. And John 15 and 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Now the notion that the world can be tweaked into being an ally for you is just as foolish as the notion that the world hates the church because it's jealous of the church's wealth, health, and prosperity. Because both are rooted in the notion that the world isn't all that bad. If you just tweak them a little bit, just sprinkle on a little Jesus, it'll be all right. The reality is the world is fallen. It's an enmity against God, not allied with him. Those who are of the world know the truth that God is good. They know right from wrong and they hate it. Therefore, they must either redefine good or redefine God. But in order to deliver you from that false teaching, 
God disciplines you, purges you of all those things that would blind you to God's will and make you deaf to God's word. Now, it hurts the old Adam. I admit it. And you admit it too. But it's good for you. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of the shedding of your own blood. And have you forgot the exhortation that addresses you as God's children? My child, do not regard rightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when you're reproved by it. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every child whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as his children. For what child is there whom his father does not discipline? God disciplines us not out of irritation or of a thirst for vengeance. It's not because you irritated him and got out of his nerve, but in love and in the passion of his holiness. Continuing at verse 9, besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seems best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later, Peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God sent Jesus into the world, the Missio Dei, the sending of God to save us. And that involves suffering. Jesus sends us into the world. The Missio, Ecclesia, the Missio, the sending of the church to share that good news with the world. And that involves it is God's painfully perfect plan. But in the end, the purpose outweighs the pain. If we are made partakers, sharers of his holiness, as we see the kingdom established on earth as it is in heaven. Now I'm taught that when our Lord Jesus returns in the fullness of his glory, Jesus continued in Luke 13, verse 29, and people will come from the east, the west, from the north, and the south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. So we welcome the, the discipline of the Lord. We welcome the presence of the Lord. We welcome the goodness of and loving kindness of the Lord. Because we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. As Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28. His church knows that. The world doesn't know what it doesn't know. God wants you to know his will. Now in part, but soon, even as you now are known. Trust him to continue to do good, to continue to be faithful, to continue to keep his promises, and to continue to keep you until that day. Because the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind. Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.